One, two, three. Ready? Okay. <clears throat> well, good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. My name's Stephen Daniel. I'm a senior community liaison with the Houston Police Department. My specialty, unfortunately, is how to survive active shooters for civilians. Uh, it's kind of a shame, quite frankly, that we even have to have this discussion, but I think we all acknowledge that's the world we live in today. So. That's what we're gonna talk about is how you survive an active shooter. Now, oh, Chief Arcevedo says good evening. He couldn't be here, but I got his picture so we can see what the chief looks like. You know, we, we gotta give him credit. Uh, this is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I'm telling you, you can do it. If you get in one of these situations where there's an active shooter, if you've taken the time to create your survival mindset through visualization, you can do it. Now to date, I got four survivors that have come to me and said, sir, the information you taught saved my life when the shooter started killing people all around me. Most recently was an attorney from Houston. She was out in Las Vegas at that terrible shooting. Before that was another attorney in the mall in Nairobi, Kenya. So the bottom line is this stuff really does work. Now I want to start out by talking about this gentleman here, Jason Seaman. Jason is a school teacher at a middle school up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Back in May of last year, Young boy comes to school with a gun and starts to shoot. He shoots a 13-year-old girl, then Jason goes into action. He tackles him, takes him down, got himself shot three times, but this was on Monday, and I noticed by Friday he was in the news at a softball game, so I think he's probably doing okay. But he did something, quite frankly, that's pretty spectacular because in 25 years of active shooting experience, over a 1,000 episodes, I can't find a single one where there wasn't at least one fatality. And yet, because of Jason's actions, nobody died that day. So in my book, Jason's a pretty special guy, okay? But now let's go 180 degrees around the circle. <clears throat> and we go to Sutherland Springs, Texas, where 26 people died and 20 were wounded. And then we read what old Edmund Burke says, the only thing required for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Well. I hate to say it, but that little country church is the epitome of that quote. Nobody did anything, and we look at the tragic results. So I'm telling you, if you get to that worst case scenario, you got to fight these guys. You just do. But let me tell you, we're going to talk about quite a few options ahead of time so that most likely you won't ever get to that point. But if you do, you got to fight and you got to be aggressive, all right? Now, survival mindset, that's pretty much everything in my world. So I pigeonhole people into one or three categories based on just that. Instinctive survival mindset's the first one. Just like Jason Seaman, God blessed them with this from the very beginning. But this is where I'd like to see all of you find yourselves, and that's what I call a developed survival mindset. You take this information, you process it, you think about it, you visualize, here at worship, and at work, and at school, and at the grocery store, all the different places you go, you visualize being there, a gunman coming in and applying the run, hide, fight tactics and techniques. And I'm telling you, if, 
it should happen to you in two and a half or six years from now, the odds are you will make good, intelligent decisions. By the way, I'm not really big into people carrying guns to deal with active shooters. I mean, I have a concealed license. I'm not being a hypocrite, but I'll talk more about that. But survival mindset. God has blessed us all with good brains. If we will use them, it's the most powerful weapon there is. But the majority of people, unfortunately, they fall into my third category despite my best efforts. And for lack of a better term, I just call them ostriches. They're sticking their head in the sand. They're ignoring reality. It's not going to happen to me. Those are the people I worry about because if they ever are the victim of an active shooter, most likely they're going to be the fatalities. Not a category you really want to be in. So who's a shooter? Well, they tend to be Asian or Caucasian, usually. It's as crazy white guys just is. <clears throat> now, they age and rage from 12 to 88. So there's hardly any difference in ages. Uh, we see all types of killers out there. <clears throat> they tend to be underachievers. All right, they're the kid in school that didn't make the football team, uh, is not dating the cheerleader, not on the honor roll, any of that stuff, <clears throat> but it's not their fault. Whose fault is it? Well, obviously, <clears throat> it's the fault of the people working hard, achieving their goals in life. It's their fault. These losers can't get ahead, all right? It's their fault. Now, the reality is these guys simply have inadequate coping capabilities. They just cannot cope with the pressures of the world they live in. Now, the FBI, they tell us between 2000 and 2018, we had 277 active shooting incidents. 884 people died, 1,544 were wounded, and 40% of the shooters committed suicide. Now, the majority of these shootings do tend to take place between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Now, there are certainly some outside of those parameters, but by and large, those are the hours that most of these shootings take place. <clears throat> Statistically, you're not going to be the victim of an active shooter. Hey, that sounds good, right? Look at these bullet points and tell me how comfortable you are with that. I think the reality is, forget the statistics. Any of us could become the victim of an active shooter pretty much anywhere, anytime, anyplace. That's just the reality of the world we live in today, unfortunately. Now, we do know 85% of the guns used to kill our children in school, they come from home. Now, we're having this big debate, gun control legislation. If we could just pass that legislation, we'd stop all this active shooting business. Well, maybe, maybe not. Right now, that is still an opinion. This up here, I'm sorry, that's a fact right there. 85% of the guns do come from the home. Do you think perhaps we need to be having more serious conversations with our parents about responsible gun ownership? Just an idea. We do know that 73% of the shooting shooters are familiar with the location. That's because a lot of these shooters, unfortunately, are kids in school, and they know that school inside out. 77% spend a week or more. Now, a lot of this silliness we hear on the news by these newscasters about copycat active shooters, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. It's not such. And we'll talk more about that in just a bit, but 77% do spend a week or more. These are not spontaneous events, and we'll discuss that. Now, this really troubles me. We have more likely to have these incidents occur in educational institutions or religious facilities. Stop and think for a minute. What aspect of our society is more sacred than the places we send our children to be educated and the places we choose to worship? But yet, that's where these evil people choose to do their deadly work. Now, how do I survive? Pretty good question. Hopefully, that's the reason you all showed up tonight, is how do I survive? Well, right there, I had the picture of 26 individuals, 20 children, 6 educators from Sandy Hook Elementary. Conceive in your mind just how long 4 minutes is. That's all it took for those 26 people to die four short minutes. So I'm telling you, if you're ever in a situation that is moving at that pace, 
If you don't have your predetermined survival mindset with good, intelligent responses up here, probably it's not going to work out too well. Now, this is not rocket science. It's not difficult. It's nothing more than common sense, but there's a catch. Normally, in your life, you don't spend your time thinking about this particular topic. So for just a little while, let me pull you out of your comfort zone, give you a chance to apply your own intelligence, your own common sense to this topic. And doing so, you'll establish some good sound logic and data up there in your brain. And in a crisis, most likely, you'll make a good choice that really improve your chances of going home alive. We're going to talk about common characteristics of an active shooter, prevention. Once in a while, we can prevent these things. Not too often, but we're getting better. We'll talk a lot about run, hide, fight. Pretty much the foundation of our tactics and our techniques. And we'll go into sheltering in place what a fully committed defense is. Oh, the police response. I'd be willing to say nobody in here has an accurate understanding of how the Houston Police Department is going to respond to a call of an active shooter. But by the time we finish here tonight, you're going to have a really good understanding of exactly what to expect coming through that door should that situation ever unfortunately unfold in your presence. Now, I'm going to expose you to certain tactics, certain techniques, but there's no guarantee any one tactic or technique is going to be the right thing for you two and a half or six years from now. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you basically a toolkit of ideas, and in that crisis, you are going to make that critical life and death decision for yourself. But there's no reason that everyone in here is not capable of successfully doing that if, in fact, you will take the time to visualize and create your various survival mindsets for all the places you frequent, work, school, shopping, wherever, all the places you go, you visualize this ahead of time. Now, here's the definition of an active shooter comes from the National Tactical Officers Association. The real key, down there where it talks about robbery and kidnapping. Major takeaway, an active shooter is not like any other criminal. You treat him as such, you are likely to get yourself killed. Well, what do I mean? Well, let's look at robbery. This guy wakes up, looks out the window and says, oh, it's a nice day, the sun's out, the temperature's perfect but I'm broke. I need some money to go out and have a good time. So what does he do? He goes down to the nearest financial institution, sticks a gun in their face and says, I'd like to make a withdrawal. They give him a bunch of cash. He's all giddy, gay and excited. He's got his bag full of money. He turns to leave to go have a great time. Wouldn't you know it, right there behind him is this uniformed police officer. He just came in to cash an extra duty check. Now the poor officer's got two and a half hours worth of paperwork, and this guy is in jail. Because what was his goal? It was to get money. He was not prepared to die for it. But on the other hand, you take an active shooter. Oh, man, this is my day. Look at this weather. It's perfect. I've planned. I've prepared. I've practiced. After today, they're going to know who I am. What's his message? His mission, it's to die and take as many of you with him as he possibly can. So understand, there's none of this negotiating. There's none of this talking him out of it. You'll get yourself killed pretty quickly. And understand, it does not make any difference how young, how innocent they appear. They'll kill you. I'd give anything if a few years back I'd had a chance to go to Sparks Middle School in Reno, Nevada before their active shooting event. Because when that 12-year-old started shooting and killing people, this teacher you see up here, Michael Lansbury, former Marine, did exactly as we'd expect a teacher to do. He walked up to the boy on the playground, son, calm down, relax, we're going to get through this, trust me. Little did Michael understand, every step closer, he put more and more pressure on the 12-year-old. It is reported that every step he took, the 12-year-old said the same thing. Don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. And finally, the 12-year-old pulls the trigger. Michael Lansbury died in the dirt on the playground. So understand this. There is none of this talking him out of it, okay? Run for your life because they seriously are about to kill you. We do know 60% of the active shooting events are over before the police ever get there. So obviously, there's a significant possibility you, the average citizen, 
just may play an important role in bringing this thing to a conclusion. We go to Sandy Hook. About three years ago, I had a chance to spend half a day with Colonel Danny Steubens, Connecticut State Police. Carl Steubens was in charge of managing this terrible event. I learned quite a bit from the Colonel that day. Most of it, we're not going to talk about. It's pretty unpleasant. But there is one thing that's really critically important that we need to talk about today, okay? Glad it's your phone, not mine. <laughs> anyway, here's, here's the deal with Sandy Hook. You know, those people, uh, it was just a pure tragedy up there. And Steubens told me, he said, look, you know, you can't imagine how terrible that was. Let's look at that little town. First of all, the people that were murdered, I mean, they were hugely affected and their families. But it doesn't stop there. You know, it goes beyond that because after they replaced the shot out glass in the school, they mopped up the blood in the hall in the classrooms. What remained? A perfectly good elementary school. Nothing wrong with the building at all. But the people in Newtown could not stand to drive around their little village, look down there, see that schoolhouse, be reminded of this horrible event. So guess what? They got together and they took a vote and they bulldozed down a perfectly good school building. The house where the shooter grew up over a million dollars bulldozed down, filled in the basement. To this day, the people of Newtown are still reeling from that terrible, terrible event. But it doesn't stop there. Colonel Steuben told me, he says, look, 50% of my officers that engaged have subsequently come to me and said, Colonel, I can't ever do that again. They've given up their careers in law enforcement. They've moved on to find new professions. And Colonel Steuben's and the 50% that have remained, they're all getting counseling on a regular basis. These horrible events do not just drift away, I'm telling you. Now we see the little lady up there. She has a look of anguish on her face, rightly so, because that phone call she's taking has just advised her her baby is dead. Three weeks later, she comes out and makes this statement. We cannot control the situation that come to us in life. We can only choose how to respond to them. First, I think there's tremendous truth in that statement about life in general. But my goal tonight is to focus on that word choose. I want to give you some very viable, credible, intelligent choices for which you could choose should you unfortunately ever become the victim of an active shooter, choices that would significantly improve your odds of survival. Now we go to Virginia Tech back in 2007. 32 killed. 29 wounded. Now, with the exception of the Second Battle of Fallujah and the helicopter crash trying to rescue Marcus Luttrell, you would be hard-pressed to find a battle scene in Iraq or Afghanistan that suffered those kind of casualties. Nonetheless, that's what played out on a university campus back in 2007. And for many years, I've been telling my audiences, this is the deadliest active shooting event in the history of our country. Oh, and by the way, you know what today is? It's the anniversary of that terrible shooting, okay? So, but anyway, that's, that's Virginia Tech. Well, what took place? Okay, it started off in the dormitory, all right? Pretty quickly, it moved from there to Norris Hall, up on the second floor. Language classes are in session this morning. First one to notice something out of the ordinary, the French professor. She opens the door, looks down the hall, sees the shooter, comes back in, call 911, get under your desk. Now look at those desks. Do you really think that's going to protect you from this lunatic shooter? But let me say, there is just one problem here. As smart as this lady was, she never contemplated violence in her classroom, and when it came knocking on the door, she was devoid of any intelligent response. The consequence, when the shooter decided to depart, he left 11 dead students. Number 12, the professor. A number of other students seriously wounded. Gun smoke drifting through the air. Phones ringing, people screaming, crying. Right next door, somebody had this crazy idea. Barricade the door, tables, chairs, everything up against the door frame. And then, to top it off, this class had a pretty special kind of guy. This professor 
had survived the Holocaust. And so what does he do? He puts himself against the door and holds it. And of course, the shooter starts shooting through the door. Professor dies. But not a child, not a student in that class was harmed at all because of that survival mindset, barricading the door and keeping the shooter out. So that is absolutely critical. Now, right after the massacre at the movie theater up in Aurora, Colorado, the mayor's office, a homeland protection right here in Houston, Texas, came out with this video called Run, Hide, Fight. It's really become pretty much the standard training video all across the country. It's self-explanatory. Disarm. 
Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or attend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Okay, <clears throat> you saw the bad guy. He looked pretty ferocious. He is, he's a retired SWAT officer, okay? But most of the shooters aren't like that. They're little wimps. The only thing that makes them big is they got a gun in their hand. So don't get it locked in. Oh, I couldn't possibly deal with that guy. Yes, you can if it gets to that point. But we're gonna talk about several options ahead of time that hopefully will avoid ever getting to that point. Now, after Las Vegas, I got thinking about the situation. I think there's a new strata of shooter coming on scene, and it tends to be middle to older age white males. I mean, that's me. I'm sorry. It just is. And I got thinking, what's driving these guys? Well, I think, number one, they're really frustrated with the world we live in today. I mean, I don't care what your political beliefs are. Right now in this country, there is so much frustration in the political arena. It's just crazy. But not only that. The world these guys grew up in is not much at all like the world we live in today with all the technology and everything else going on. And for a handful of these people like the Vegas shooter, all they know how to do is take it out through this excessive violent behavior, okay? So all I'm saying is we just need to be alert to this new potential. But then, honestly, I started asking myself, Stephen, do you really have a clue what you're talking about? But guess what? Just about that time, the FBI came to my rescue. They gave me a new pie chart after seven years. Now, instead of the majority of shootings in schools, it's in the workplace. But do I think there's any fewer shootings in school? No, not really. There's just a few more in the workplace, and that's kind of skewing the percentages in that direction, okay? So all I'm saying is we just need to be sensitive and alert to the potential of a shooter in that category I just discussed. But let me tell you, where do heroes come from? Hollywood. Look, this is not about being a hero. This is about going home alive to your family. Plain and simple, right there, all right? Now, we've all heard this expression, fight or flight, right? Well, let me tell you, for an active shooter, there's a third F, and it's freeze. If you don't have a survival mindset, you're very likely going to simply freeze and when you do, it's pretty much all over at that point, okay? So having a survival mindset will help you to prevent freezing up. Now, let me tell you, you don't want to do anything that's going to prolong your departure. We saw in the video the lady that was going crazy and frozen with fear. All right, hey, when you're running out of the building, you holler at people, come on, come on, we got to go. That's fine. Somebody's starting to come in the door as you're going out. There's a shooter. Go. Sure, that's fine. But for that person that's frozen with fear, I'm sorry. You're not going to stop and prolong your departure to try to beg and plead and talk them into going to safety for their own good because I'm telling you, if you do, you're very likely going to get shot and killed. So none of that stopping to get people that don't know what to do. Now let me say this. By visualizing these things ahead of time, you're probably going to reduce the response time you have. I mean, when we hear sounds of violence, loud noises, maybe it's a car backfiring or whatever, we process that for a minute and then, oh, we may come to the conclusion that was a gunshot. But let me tell you, if you've got a survival mindset and you focused on this before, you're likely going to narrow that window and that gives you more time to get up, get out, to save your life, all right? And remember, what is the one and only goal? Go home alive to your family. That's it right there. Now, the best defense is obviously to prevent these things from ever happening. 
once in a while we can actually do that. Uh, it's not too often, but sometimes we can. We are seriously getting a little better at that. But let me tell you, 25% of all the shootings occur in our schools where our children are. But you know what's really tragic about that is this. 75% of the time, some student knew about it ahead of time and didn't say anything. Now, quite frankly, I don't think you and I, parents and grandparents, we're not doing quite as good a job as we could teaching values and courage. If we're teaching the right values, these young people would understand the difference between schoolyard loyalty and life and death situations. If we're teaching courage, they wouldn't have a problem walking up to that principal, that teacher going, Charlie's got a gun in his backpack today. If we could do a better job teaching those two lessons, we would have a lot fewer fatalities in our school every year. But clearly, if we're going to prevent these, we have to know what to watch out for. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to hit about 28 bullet points very quickly of just what those signs, those actions are that if we by chance are around this disturbed person ahead of time, we might recognize and be able to cause some type of intervention. Now let me tell you, the most powerful weapon I have to give you tonight is this right here, situational awareness. Develop situational awareness in your lifestyle, wherever you are, at work, at worship, traveling, I don't care where you are, pay attention to what's going on around you. That is so very vital. You know, and if you have care and custody of one of three categories of people, children, medically infirmed or elderly, Frankly, I think you have a moral imperative to exhibit situational awareness for their well-being as well as your own. But hey, if you get distracted or you just don't think it's a big deal, expect one or two things to happen. One, you'll likely have some kind of accident. Okay, maybe it's simple as tripping over the curb going out there to the car. Or maybe it's as serious as pulling right out there in front of a concrete truck. Or two, some low-life criminal is going to pick up on your inattention. He's going to perpetrate some kind of crime against you. He's going to steal your car, uh, kidnap you, murder you, whatever. I'm telling you, stay aware of what's going on around you. That is just so very vital. And look, to go along with this, develop a critical eye. What's that? One well, days after this, Whenever you go, say, into a restaurant to eat, first thing you do, exit, exit. You identify the exits. Just in case something bad goes down, you know how to get up and get out of there. That is absolutely critical, okay? And if that hostess wants to sit you by the front door, that's not the place you want to sit because let me tell you, that's probably the first place the shooter is going to start killing people, all right? Just keep that in mind. Now, we learned some valuable lessons from Las Vegas. Oh my gosh, do you realize there were over 800 injuries out there? 800? In my lifetime, I don't recall any situation in America where we had that many civilian casualties. Look, there's no city in America that has enough first responders and can get them on scene quick enough to deal with that. It's just, uh-uh, it doesn't happen, all right? So the bottom line is, we all need to learn how to do basic first aid for, C, uh, for gunshot wounds. That's absolutely critical. But understanding these lessons from Las Vegas is so important. Number one lesson we learn is whenever you go out in public, your safety depends on you. Depending on where you're going, what you're doing, making intelligent decisions. I mean, let's be honest. There's certain places in Houston, Texas, as much as I love this city, there's certain places that none of us have any business being at 3 o'clock in the morning. Not a smart move, okay? we got to think about these things ahead of time. So look around, pay attention to where you're going, what you're doing. Now, let me share something with you. I think we all know what happened in Las Vegas, right? Outdoor concert, big hotels looking down, okay? Have you ever thought about Discovery Green downtown? Nice new hotels outside around it, okay? I was at teaching at one of the new hotels the other day. I asked the director of security, I said, sir, what do you do? Somebody rolls that luggage cart in, bags piled up, five or six long guns hanging up there. Well, sir, we let them take them to their room. You gotta understand, look how many gun shows a year we have at GRB right across the street. And those people, they stay in our hotel. And let me tell you, they're not gonna leave their guns in the convention center overnight. So all I'm saying, folks, is hey, 
many times a year we have activities at Discovery Green and simultaneously there just may be a significant number of weapons in those hotel rooms looking down on Discovery Green. We are no more exempt in Houston, Texas from one of those horrible tragedies like Las Vegas suffered than anywhere else in the country. So I propose having your survival mindset with good, intelligent responses ahead of time is not a bad idea, okay? Now when we hear shots, oh my gosh, I've heard so many survivors of active shooting events, they're interviewed and they all say the same thing. It's like they had the same script. They all say, well, I heard the sound. I thought it was fireworks. Really? Fireworks? Let me tell you, there's no promoter or producer in his right mind, in my opinion, that's going to incorporate fireworks into a program in this day and age. The only exception to that is most likely our 4th of July, okay? But, you know, so here's the rule. You hear a loud sound out in public, it is a gunshot until you know better. So treat every loud sound as a gunshot until proven otherwise because that may make the difference. That may give you the extra 20, 30 seconds of time you need to get up, get out to save your life. Now, let me say this. Again, we saw mass casualties out there in Vegas. You and I, we've now become the first responder because there's no city that has enough first responders, no way. I listened to a trauma doctor from Vegas. He said, hey, you get somebody on my operating room table in five minutes, suffered a massive loss of blood, gunshot, car wreck, industrial accident, makes no difference if in that five minutes nobody's done anything to stem the loss of blood. Let me tell you what's going to happen. They're going to die on my operating room table every time. So folks, it's become inherently necessary that we all know first aid for gunshot wounds, how to put a tourniquet on a limb, how to put pressure on a wound that you can't get a tourniquet on, how to take a candy wrapper, hold it over a sucking chest wound, very basic, very essential. And look, it may be a total stranger you save their life, but it also may be a family member. So I really encourage you strongly to get some basic training and first aid for gunshot wounds. Where are you going to get that? Well, here's an option. It's pretty good. Southeast Texas Regional Advisory Council, known as SETRAC. It's a government agency, and they go around a 17-county area around Harris County, and they teach first responders, both firefighters and police officers, the fundamental skills they need to service us as first responders. And guess what? They're now coming into the civilian arena. They got this course called Stop the Bleed. It's about a two hour training and they'll come into your facility. They'll come here and they will do this training for free. All you gotta do is call that number and they will come out and teach this course to you. Another option is the American Red Cross for 25 bucks. You can take a 30 minute online course. Uh, but seriously, Get that training. Get them out here. Get as many of your people together as you can because the more people you teach this, the more lives they will save, I'm telling you, okay? Technology. <laughs> we used to take a pad and paper and write a pencil. Yeah. People, they, they don't know how to write with pencils anymore, right? So that's okay. That's, he got it. Now, the FBI, they tell us there's five phases to an active shooter. And I agree spot on. In fact, this morning I was teaching a group, and there just happened to be the Houston head of the FBI there. And he said, yes, sir, you're on target. That's it. Okay. First, they fantasize. They obsess about doing these terrible acts. Oh, and then they create a plan. Let me tell you, these active shooters... They're crazy. They're really crazy. But don't sell them short. They are not stupid. They're smart, but they are mentally ill. There's no getting around it. But look at Parkland, Florida, Santa Fe, Texas. Look at the plans they created. As evil as they were, you got to admit their plans were successful. Look at the body count. Yeah, no, they're not stupid. They're just evil. They prepare. They may go out and buy the G.I. Joe garb, all the stuff that makes them feel strong and macho. Practice. Maybe like the Columbine boys, they go out and target practice. Even have their friends videotape it. And number five, they kill all these people. Well, what's critical about this? Obviously, there's a timeline. These are not spontaneous events. But that's a good thing because during this time, 
They just cannot help but put off certain signals, certain red flags, certain suicidal indicators. And if you by fate just happen to consistently be around these troubled people, you may be able to cause some type of intervention, all right? How would you do that? Well, here's a, a good option right there, direct encounter. Charlie, what's going on, man? I see you're having problems. Sit down, and we're gonna talk through this right now. Most people are not good with that, that's okay. Go to supervisors at work, go to HR, senior management. If nobody in the organization is comfortable with it, that's okay, give us a call. We just happen to be the only police department in America that has an entire division with a commander running it that focuses exclusively on dealing with the mentally ill. In that division, we have 18 to 20 CIT officers, crisis intervention trained, and we pair them up with clinicians from the Mental Health Association. Every day, we have four of those teams in patrol cars driving around the city of Houston. We get a 911 call with a mental health nexus, we send a team out. They get on scene. Here's that paranoid schizophrenic. He's trying to communicate, but it's almost like he has a tin bucket over his head. He just can't get it out. Thank goodness our team of trained professionals know how to work with this guy. And in most cases, we end up with a peaceful resolution to a mental health crisis. Unfortunately, in the past, and currently in other locations that don't have our resources, it tends to go tragically violent. So don't hesitate. Give us a call. Let us get out there and get involved. Now, in the last six or seven months, the mental health unit, they've developed an additional capability. They've taken four seasoned officers that are CIT trained, and they've given them extensive additional training from the Mental Health Association. And when people like you call us at that number and say, hey, this guy at work, he's acting like this and doing this, I think that's a problem. We go, yeah, that sounds like an issue. We send this team of officers out. We sit down in private with this guy and we talk to him. If, in fact, he needs immediate mental health intervention, we'll get it for him. And if we feel like he's a threat to himself or to others, we'll get a court order. We'll go into his home, remove his weapons for safekeeping until he's healthy and stable and responsible once again. But we got to hear from you. But you know what? I'm not really too concerned about the adult population doing that. You know what I am concerned about? Where do we have 25% of our shootings? School. Stop and think, when you're in school as a kid in high school, peer pressure, it's pretty strong. Now, I do think most of our children have good values and want to do the right thing, but that peer pressure is very strong, very dominating, okay? So what's the thing? They want to do the right thing, but they don't want to be known as a person that was a rat or told on anybody. They don't want them to know they were the one. So guess what? We've come up with a new idea. Here's a group you may be familiar with, Crime Stoppers. We've worked with them, and we're developing this relationship, and we're, this is a prototype of a poster that we're creating that we have hopes of distributing throughout our school systems so that these kids can look up there and say, oh, there are three ways I can communicate with Crime Stoppers and tell them about Joey over here and what he's planning to do, and nobody ever has to know it was me. So I really think that's something that's going to end up saving a lot of lives that we've come up with, okay? Characteristics, one well, active shooter, they have an ax to grind there, an injustice clerk. Everything that's wrong in the world is targeted towards them, they think. They're usually white males. Occasionally, ladies get in the act, but usually it's white males. Targets are usually victims in their own age group at work, home, school, church. Do I really have to mention that lately we've seen a significant uptick in houses of worship? My God, I mean, we saw the tragedy in New Zealand. And just before that, the tragedy up in Pennsylvania. And then Sutherland Springs, Texas. And let me tell you, frankly, it doesn't make a bit of difference what your faith is. I mean, we see, we go from uh, the Muslims in New Zealand to the Jews in Pennsylvania to the Baptist outside of San Antonio. They don't care what your faith is. They just want to kill people. So to me, that's just tragic. 
But often, they don't have an exit strategy. They're often suicidal. If this is a coworker, they may come up to you one day and go, here, I want you to have this. Latest thing out. Got it last week at the new story at the Galleria. Cost me 1200 bucks. It's yours. Don't argue. I want you to have it. I know you're fine folks. But really, a coworker offering to give you something of significant value, that ought to be telling you in big, bold letters, this guy's getting ready to check out. He knows where he's going. He can't take that smartphone with him, so he's going to give it to you. Any of these suicidal indicators giving away things of great value, which is out of the norm, ought to be a big red flag telling you this guy's headed to the wrong direction. There's no consistent, clearly identifiable profile. Now. We all know the FBI has a profile on every criminal out there, right? Wrong. They don't have one on active shooter. So what's the deal? Well, here's the thing. Let's go back to that bank robber we talked about. You know, he robs a bank. Sooner or later, he's caught, convicted. He goes up to prison. On a nice day, a couple of agents from the bureau get in the car. They drive up to the prison. They sit on across the table. They give the guy a bag of Cheetos and a soda. They talk for a couple of hours. They talk about really deep topics, sports cars, weather girls. Those agents are really very good at developing a psychological profile of a bank robber. How many active shooters have you seen go to prison? Quite a few die right there on the scene. So the problem is we, we don't we understand the product of the thought, but not the process. And the peculiar observation, we've seen a 12-year-old in Reno, a 19-year-old in Connecticut, a 34-year-old at the Navy Yard in D.C. They all seem to have identically cloned mindsets. It's a mystery. We do not understand. Maybe someday, but right now, we don't have a clue what's going on. Warning signs, they're argumentative, they're uncooperative with supervisors, they have rage reactions, they're always the victim, they blame others. Had the privilege of raising teenagers, huh? You might identify with that bullet point. Uh, increase accidents, they make a lot of mistakes, Ma they manipulate and exploit others, bully threaten or committing violence, they're withdrawn, depressed, they avoid coworkers. You gotta understand, these people cannot cope with the real world out there. They just can't. So consequently, they hide in the foggy world of drugs and alcohol. But a lot of times, when life's getting overwhelming, what's more real than work? So they skip work quite a bit as well. They just can't deal with the real world. Noticeable decrease in grooming and personal hygiene, increased severe mood swings, unstable emotional responses, Suicidal talks, putting things in order. Coworker, he may come up to you one day and go, hey, just got my will rewritten. Everything's organized. It's all in place. Don't worry. It's not going to be a problem for you or anybody. I got it all worked out. That's the kind of talk they're likely to share with you. They're paranoid. What a surprise that one is. They talk of problems at home. They can't deal with the problems at home. So they bring them to work thinking maybe you can help. But if you're smart, you'll run from that opportunity as quick as you can. They talk of previous incidents of violence. They express empathy for individuals committing violence. They're the kind, <clears throat> after the massacre at the movie theater up there in Aurora, Colorado, they're likely to come to work the next day, say something like this. Did you see the Joker? Did you see that dude, man, he came alive? Those people he put down that movie theater, they didn't get up. That was the real thing. None of this Hollywood stuff, no, it was real. They're not going to hesitate to use that crazy talk with you because to them, that's normal. And they know you're normal, so why wouldn't you understand it? That's how they're likely to express themselves. Increase unsolicited comments about firearms, other deadly weapons, and violent crimes. Now, on pretty much any given day, driving the freeways to Houston, coming to work, half a dozen of those characteristics probably apply to me. But we all have bad days, you know? Here's the key right there, consistency. Do you see somebody day in, day out, week in, week out, consistently exhibiting a few of these characteristics? If you do, please get in touch with us. Let's do something about it. Let's not let it just take place. But if you come to work tomorrow, somebody comes over, gets up in your face, and gives you a really hard time, don't go running down the way, lock yourself in a room, grab the phone, call 911, say we got an active shooter. But if you see a consistent pattern, yeah, you need to get something going. 
Now, when shots are fired, the first thing you want to do is escape. Like my little golden guy, get up, get out, run for your life, get out of there. That is always your first option, all right? Now, let me say this. About a year ago, I'm at the Hobby Center one night teaching a group of volunteers. And during one of the videos, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, it dawns on me. There's a lady on the front row, and she is wearing this iridescent orange jogging suit. And it dawns on me, oh my gosh, don't make yourself an enhanced target for the shooter. I mean, if I'm the shooter and I look out in this crowd of dull grays, greens, browns, oh, and somebody's wearing bright orange? Really? What do you think is going to attract my attention? That bright color. So you really don't want to be doing that. If you have something really bright on, you know, shuck it, get rid of it. Don't make yourself an enhanced target. Okay. You're at the dentist. You just finish up. You're on the ground floor of this five-story building. You're getting ready to come back to work. You open the door of the hall. All of a sudden, shots ring out. You look in the lobby. Oh, my God, a guy with a rifle shooting. People dropping blood everywhere. And you look the opposite direction. What do you see? Exit. You tell yourself, when he looks that way, I'm gone. Don't do that. The second you step in that hall, you just gave yourself a 50-50 chance of dying. If you got a survival mindset, i.e., you have visualized being in a situation like this before, what you will do is about face. Go back through that building, get to an outside window, take a heavy object, throw it through the window, and go to safety. Even from the second floor, break the window and jump. You young guys back there, you'll bounce right back us more experienced folks in life, we're going to get one, two months of rehab. But let me tell you, it's a lot better than an AK-47 round rattling around between your ears. But you know, the, the truth is, we're not accustomed to destroying property. If you haven't visualized doing this, you're very likely not going to break that window. What you're going to do instead, you're going to roll the dice with your life, step out into the hallway, and folks, that's not a good bet. It's not a good gamble. You're very likely to get shot and killed, so don't do that. But I don't know where you work, but where I work, I got a problem with that because I work on the 21st floor. It's a long way down, so there's no breaking the window. So here's the thing. You're in a building, the third floor or anything higher, it's a different ball game. Here's a ball game. Feel the play, the floor you're on, period. You're not going to get on the elevator because if those doors open, you have no chance. Stairwells, forget the stairwells. You know, the fire department, they love their concrete fireproof stairwells. But let me tell you, for an active shooter, it's nothing more than a vertical shooting gallery with the added benefit that if he misses, the ricochet may kill you. Stay out of the stairwells. So what does that leave? That leaves all the hideouts on that floor, file rooms, copy rooms, restrooms, whatever. You're running down the way, you round the corner, you get your hand on the restroom door. At the last second, you look up and it says, women. Oh, my God. And because you don't have a survival mindset, what you do is you keep moving on down till you get to the appropriate restroom for the men. Unfortunately, you get shot and killed in the process. you got to understand, any port in a storm is okay. doesn't make any difference. The whole object, live to see the next day, okay? So get that locked in. But let's be honest. There's a lot of things we do every day to be polite, civilized people. But look. When your life is on the line, forget that stuff. You do whatever it takes because what's the one goal? Go home alive to your family. That's it. All right? So the third floor or higher, it's a different ball game. Now, maybe at your workstation or your desk, you got a pair of scissors. You hear shots or what you think are shots, grab those scissors, take them with you, just in case running doesn't work, hiding fizzles out. You have to go hands-on, face-to-face with this lunatic. At least you got your scissors, okay? That's important. Possessions. Look, I don't care what you have. Computer, backpack, whatever the case may be. Leave that stuff behind because here's the thing. I don't care if the threat to your life is a fire, a terrorist, an active shooter. It doesn't make any difference. In the moment, all that counts is you getting up, getting out. So tell me, what do you possess that is so valuable that you're willing to risk your life to keep that? Leave your stuff behind. You can come back later and get it. Worst case scenario, you have to replace it. Understand. We can't replace you. 
That's critical. Get these things in the correct order of priority, all right? Hiding out, it's a pretty good idea, especially at work. Figure out, hey, if I couldn't get out of here and bullets are coming, where can I go to hide out that he can't get to me, all right? Can I lock the door? Can I barricade it? That's pretty important. Let me tell you, 25 years active shooting experience, over 1,000 episodes, I cannot find one where the shooter breached a door that was secured somehow. It was barricaded, it was locked, it was jammed with a wedge, it was tied with a... They don't do that. Why? Well, these guys have what I call an operational intelligence. And that tells them, I got about a six minute window of opportunity, shoot and kill as many people as I can before the police get here and put me down. So. Do you think they're really going to spend any time trying to breach the door you're hiding behind? Or are they going to just move on down the way and look for that easy kill shot? I'm telling you, they're not going to kick the door in. You get behind the door, secure it somehow, move to the far recesses of the room, you probably got it made. Now, if you're in charge of the facility at work, pick out some safe rooms that would be a good place to hide and put peepholes looking out. Because when all this is over and one of our officers is banging on the door, Houston police, come on out. How do you know it is? Wouldn't it be nice to have a peephole and just look? And say, oh, uniformed officer, we can go out. Or, no, it's the bad guy. Back up. Get away. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Thumb turn deadbolts. Smart idea, easy to operate, easy to install, all right? Put those on that safe room, all right? Now, turn off the lights, turn off your cell phone. We have these big, heavy commercial doors all over Houston. I know you've seen them. If you measure them, they're an inch and a half thick, solid hunk of wood. You'd think, hey, that'd be pretty good to get behind when somebody's shooting at me. So I took two square feet of door from headquarters. I gave it to SWAT. I said, hey, you know what? Shoot this thing. Look at that. Every single round came through with what I call terminal velocity. In other words, these big, heavy commercial doors, you're standing behind it, somebody shoots through it, hits you in a vital organ, you're probably going to die. So if those things are no good to get behind, well, what is? A lot of our buildings around town built with concrete columns, reinforced steel. Great thing to get behind. And flat on the ground is always your best bet. The more mass between you and the bullet, a bunch of filing cabinets, whatever, the more mass, the better off you are. So look around at work. Say, if things went bad real quick and I couldn't get out of here and somebody's shooting, what do I duck down behind and take cover? That's really important. Now let me ask you a question. Is your car cover? Yes and no. If you lie down in line with a front axle where that cast iron engine block can catch the bullet, that's good. But anywhere behind the front axle, I'm sorry, that bullet's coming in one side of that 10 car and outside the other of the 10, and it's going to hit you and kill you. Uh-uh. So understand that. The only place behind the car that is really good protection is lying down in line with a front axle. Now, you know, Pretty much everywhere we go, even if we have our license to carry, we can't carry our weapons these days, especially in most work environments. But you know what? We still have weapons everywhere, folks. You know, my favorite fire extinguishers, those are all over the place. You know, you grab one of those, you stand next to the door. If somehow he can get through the door, you stick that nozzle in his face, you pull that trigger, and you let it go till it's empty. You're going to seriously disorientate it, and then when it's empty, it's going to be nice and light, so take it, hit him over the head a few times, all right? Uh, any kind of broken glass held in a cloth, pair of scissors, knife, whatever. Now, I do send my 18-year-old to school every day with a deadly weapon right there, ballpoint pen. You go, are you serious, ballpoint pen? Let me tell you, former police officer wakes up every morning a quadriplegic because somebody stabbed him in the neck with a ballpoint pen. This is my message. Your continued existence is on the line here. You use anything and everything with the maximum aggression you can muster so you live to see tomorrow. That's critical. Now, weapons. You see that car up there? Is your car a weapon? You bet it is. Absolutely. 2017, one morning early, I find myself standing on Law Street just off of Westland. In the previous 30 minutes, this lunatic had seriously shot and wounded 10 people, all of them in their cars. Now, unfortunately, nobody had this survival mindset I was talking about. 
But what would have happened if the first person that morning that backed out of those garages attached to the condos pulled up to the gate, the gate opened, and here's this lunatic standing in the street, point blank range, firing right through his windshield and hitting him in the chest. If he had a survival mindset, instead of turning the car to the left, as he did in reality, and get away from the threat, what do you think he would have done different with a survival mindset? He would have run him down, you bet, straight ahead, gunned it. He would have driven him in to the side of that little green Porsche you see up there. And the outcome? Well, nine more people that morning would not have been shot at all if the first person had a survival mindset. So, folks, again, I can't stress how important it is that we all have our own personal, customized survival mindset for the world we live in. Now here's a technique you might want to think about. In these situations, let me tell you, it's going to be stressful and you just might lose control, but here's a good way a lot of our military guys, especially snipers do, it's called combat breathing. And how that works is you breathe in to a count of four, you hold it to a count of four, you exhale to a count of four, and you do it four times your blood pressure comes down, you get control of yourself, and now you are better prepared to deal with this situation, okay? So just keep that in mind. That is uh, a real key that you can use. Run, hide, fight. Okay, we've gotten somehow to this worst case scenario. We're gonna have to fight this guy. We're gonna have to go hands-on in mortal combat with this lunatic. But newsflash. You can do this. You really can. It is going to take a radical mindset change because most likely this is not where we spend much of our mental capital thinking about this kind of stuff. But here's my question. As a parent or grandparent, the day this lunatic shows up to kill, you've brought that precious child with you. And, of course, that child's right there in harm's way. Here's my question. Are you capable of getting incredibly vicious and violent in order to save that child? Of course you are. That's the place we all have to go to be successful at mortal combat with these lunatics. But I'm telling you, if you have visualized ahead of time, you will be way ahead of the game. Because look, your brain is not accustomed to this excessive violent behavior. But if you have visualized ahead of time, you may just plant enough little seeds up there in your brain and they take root that in fact you can keep yourself under control. But this just may be the most important bullet point in the entire presentation. You control your emotions. You do not let your emotions control you. That is absolutely essential. When you give up and let your emotions get the best of you, it's pretty much all over. What do bees do? Swarm everywhere, right? Okay, you're at the mall one day. You're there with a bunch of friends, you're going shopping, you're, you're going to get that fishing gear you want in, whatever. And of course, we all know where you got to start an expedition like that. You got to start at Starbucks getting your coffee, right? Okay. So you're standing around, you're drinking your coffee, and all of a sudden this guy in the crowd in the mall whips out a pistol and starts shooting indiscriminately. And you're going, oh my God. We have no place to hide. We have no weapons. What are we going to do? Well, if you've got a survival mindset, you're going to tell your friends, we've got to jump this guy. He's going to kill us. That's all. Go right now. You tackle him. You get him to the ground. Yeah, somebody may get shot and may get killed. But if you stand there and do nothing, I guarantee it's not going to work out well for you. You know, back uh, on that unfortunate day, 9-11, those guys flying that plane into uh, over Pennsylvania, what those brave guys on the plane do? They swarmed those terrorists. They took them down. They took that plane down. They died. Yeah, I know. But if that plane had been allowed to fly into D.C., how many more people would have died? So swarming is just one more option. It's a tool that you can choose. But how do you decide that? Critical thinking. You are allowed to think critically. If that means overriding some of the things I've told you so far, do it. Look, let me explain this. In any of these life-threatening situations, it could be a fire, it could be a terrorist, it could be an active shooter. You never know when one minute may determine whether you live or die. So you got to make these critical decisions. And if it, like I said, if it means going over something I just told you, I don't care, do it. 
example, Sandy Hook Elementary. They have a lockdown policies like schools all across the country, and I'm a big proponent of our schools locking down in these situations. But two teachers at Sandy Hook said, no, children, come with me. They run out the door, down the hall, out the outside door, up the hill to the fire station. Do you know not a child in either of those two classes was harmed at all? And right next door, that next classroom was a tragic bloodbath of dead children. So understand this. In the moment, you are allowed to make the best decision you can, okay? Yes. Well, you know, if it came down to it, and it re you really thought getting out the window was going to save your life, do you really care about getting expelled? <laughs> I mean, in these terrible situations, you've got to make the best decision you can. Now, I will tell you, I really think in our schools, locking down and staying put in that classroom is your best bet. I really do. Because when you start running around, then that shooter's out there, and he, you may be running across the playground, and he thinks, oh, that's cool, man, and he tracks you, and he fires and kills you. So generally, that is the good idea, is to lock down. So I wouldn't terribly disagree with your school, all right? Yes? Speak up. Sure they are, but frankly, you don't have any choice. Yeah, they know that everybody's going to lock down. But here's the thing, too. You've got to keep this in mind. Uh, a friend of mine, his wife is a school teacher, and she said, you know, the problem is we, we keep the door locked all the time, but any kind of kid comes up and he bans on the door, the first student in the class jumps up and automatically op opens the door. You can't do that. You know, the teachers got to educate the students that, hey, okay, if you're going to open the door, before you do, you look out that little window and you see what it looks like. I don't care if you know the student, if he's got a gun in his hand, you don't open that door, okay? We gotta start thinking smart, okay? So that's the thing right there. So 1999, Columbine High School. Took three hours to resolve that issue. We realized afterwards our protocol to deal with active shooters was pretty poor. So we developed an entirely new approach. Pretty well accepted from New York to LA to Houston and points in between. And it goes like this. Every officer has been through two days of active shooter training. And it's a real deal, I'll tell you folks, because I'm the only civilian I know of that's been through it. And we take the fight to the bad guy. We don't sit back waiting for SWAT to get there. Now, let me be honest with you. In the early days of this new protocol, we told the officers, you get there, you get geared up and ready to go. You stand by until one or two more officers get there to back you up and you go. Uh-uh. After Sandy Hook, we got talking amongst ourselves and we said, wait a minute. We can't stand out there in the parking lot ready to go, waiting for one or two officers to come back us up. Because every time we hear a shot fired, we know it's another student dying. We can't do that. So we basically have changed the protocol in writing all across the country. First officer on scene with or without backup, knowing he's got a 47% chance of getting shot or killed, he goes, he goes in to stop the killing period, all right? We've looked at our firearms, our tactical training, long guns. We currently have about 1,400 officers carrying assault rifles out there on the street, okay? We also teach the priority of life scale. Officer, you get on the street, you have to make that gut-wrenching decision. Who lives, who dies? We're telling you right there, hostages, innocent, bystanders, first pass on living, second class citizen. Oh, these guys. You gotta realize, once upon a time, every officer raised his or her right hand, in essence, what they said. If it's absolutely necessary, there's no other option I'll put my life out there on the line for the citizens of Houston, Texas. Come down to headquarters, 1200 Travis. We got a nice museum that's free on the ground floor. At the back is that granite wall. Unfortunately, after Harvey, we now have 114 names 
on that wall. That represents 114 men and women that fulfilled that promise to you and to me that we might live in a relatively safe city. So I'd ask this. Every time you see one of those officers with a badge up here on his or her chest, tell yourself this. In essence, when they came to work today, they promised their boss a whole lot more than I ever promised my boss. Those are the kind of men and women we have out there every day, every night, willing to put it on the line, if necessary, for folks like you and me. But what about these guys, suspects? Wait a minute. He killed eight of my coworkers, and you're going to let him live? Yes, if we can. We are in the business of saving lives. We're not judge, jury, and executioner. If we can save their low life, we will do it. But understand this. We will do whatever it takes to stop the killing if he gives us no choice. Now, every time I say that, I have to f go back to downtown Dallas, Texas, here a year or so ago, when that tactically proficient lunatic assassinated five Dallas police officers that night and one civilian. And being tactically proficient, he retreated into a parking garage because he knew those thick concrete walls would stop the bullets, right? Well, guess what? Dallas PD, just like Houston, is pretty resourceful. So what'd they do? They took their little robot. They ran it up to the wall. They put a package on the wall. They backed the robot up. They pushed a button, and the wall disappeared along with a shooter. Let me tell you, we will do whatever we have to to stop the killing, period. Now, pulling all this together, Alon Stevie, former commando, he teaches a college class how to deal with an active shooter. He doesn't use any martial arts or weapons. He just uses his brain, something each and every one of us, if we create our survival mindset, is perfectly capable of doing. I think you'll find this pretty interesting. I'm 
two choices out there. One is only show that has one side on you. And then two is that no, that has two sides. You need to have two sides in scenarios that come at you. That's why you need to switch to the other side. Now, what will help you? Because obviously, not the whole class of you needs to be in. Who is on the counter? The first one. Stop. So two people on each show. No, we're not going to go. I'm going to explain it. Okay, one, one. Second, second. What does everybody else do? Well, now where would it be? In front of it? It is a big lesson. When he comes in, he's looking straight ahead. He's looking straight ahead. So safety says, anybody who doesn't have a hole, many of you shouldn't have a hole in this case. Get out of the zone. Get out of the kill zone. So go there. Far corner against the same movie comes through, or that far corner. Definitely not the other. But there's going to be a few of you that are going to be inquired to one very important thing that's going to assure the success of those by the door. And that's attracting his vision and attention on them by going off there and running across the room in the opposite direction if you can help it than where the attackers, defenders are going to be pushing, positioned at. So if I'm coming here, you don't want me as a shooter to turn your wheel, right? What you gonna do? You're gonna go like that. Control object running this way. I'm coming this way. Bang! That's it. Now how much time do we have on us when I come to that door? One second. So we're talking time has now shrunk significantly for the shooter to be able to be shooting effective. So just practice with me one time the drill. We have no come here. One and you. Right there, good, good. What will help you a lot is actually push the knee here. Yeah, because that will collapse a lot easier than my tire body is pushing from front. So just aim for the knee. You see that? And let's try one time. The knee, yeah, we have five, but nice job, nice job. Shots fired in the photo. Shots fired in the photo. Nice and safe.
Okay, we saw the young lady at the door, two hands, death grip on the weapon. Really doesn't make any difference whether it's a pistol, rifle, lock onto it and let your weight take you to the ground. Whole object, get him on the ground where he can't point and shoot. <coughs> the second person should look around the room, find the trash can, get the plastic bag out of it. Then if you can, pull a table or chair up next to number one at the door, hop up on it. A little more gravity is going to help you to impact when the guy comes through. Say you brought your scissors with you, that's a good thing. You're standing on the table, he comes through, number one locks on, starts to pull him down. You fall off the table, hit him in the back of the head and the neck with your fist. Bring the scissors down into his back. He hit the floor, drive those things home, and then kind of write your initials, you know, in his back. Get his attention. Oh, and then take the plastic bag, put it over his head. Guess what? It's all over. Tough luck. <laughs> I mean, come on. He's, he's the one that started all this. Uh, you know, I, I don't, at, at this point, I'm sorry, we're not playing fair. Uh uh, none of that. Because remember, what's the goal? to go home alive to your family. That's it, okay? It's not to be Mr. Nice Guy to this evil guy that's trying to do everything he can to take you out. Uh, -uh. we're not doing that game, all right? Now, somehow, in the fight, you come up with a weapon. You sit there and hold him at gunpoint till we walk in. Oh, that's not a good idea. We hit the door, we see you holding the gun. As far as we know, you're the bad guy. You're likely to get shot. Take that weapon, throw it away. Don't take control of it. Not a smart idea, okay? First officer pulls up out front, gets out of his unit, puts a second bulletproof vest on, stops assault rifle rounds, gets a long gun, probably an assault rifle, could be a shotgun, and then he tells himself, okay, this is where I got a 47% chance of getting myself shot or killed, then guess what? He comes charging into harm's way to save innocent people. But guess what? If you're laying in the lobby of this building, you've been shot, you got three and a half to five minutes before you bleed to death, we'll walk right past you. Keep going. We're not stopping. Officer gets shot in the hall or he drops. We leave him. We're not stopping for anything or anybody until we take the shooter down because he's going to continue to kill. However, our officers have been given training and first aid for gunshot wounds. Where'd my tourniquet thing go? Uh, somewhere here. Anyway. Oh. oh, there we go. All the officers have been issued these tourniquets. Of course, as a civilian staff, had to buy my own. What else is new? You know, and the, you know this guy, Murphy? Murphy's Law says, this is going to be where? Out in the car when I need it. So what am I going to do? I tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to lay there and let myself bleed to death. Not going to happen. I'm going to grab a necktie. I'm going to grab a scarf. I'm going to grab a computer cable. I'm going to get something. Get around that limb. I am not going to let myself die. Okay? So you've got to get that powerful thought in your head that you are taking care of yourself, period. All right? Now we're going to go to the sound of the killing. A lot of times people well-intentioned, pull the fire alarm. We'll let everybody know we got a big problem. Please do not pull the fire alarm for an active shooter. Those big red trucks are racing to the scene. So are we. That's not good. We hit the lobby. That alarm's screaming so loud, we may not hear where the shots are coming from. As we go to the shooter, we can't talk to each other. And what happens in our schools where our children are when somebody pulls a fire alarm? The students flood the hall. Where do you think the shooter is likely to be? In the hall. Don't pull the fire alarm for an active shooter. Now, when we get there, we don't know the good guys from the bad guys. Raise your hand, spread your fingers, swat and say, Stephen, just ask them to lay on the ground. You're stretched out like this. You're not a threat. We keep moving to the shooter. If bullets are moving, that's about as safe as you can get right there, all right? Officers are trained that hands kill, stop and think. Hands hold guns, knives, throw punches, hands do all the bad stuff. So tomorrow, you're out and about, you're driving along. It's your lucky day. You get a personal invitation to pull to the side of the road to get better acquainted with one of our fine officers. If you were fly on the wall, what you would see is that officer coming out of his or her unit toward you, hand on weapon. Oh, that's not good. But they look up, they see your hands on the steering wheel. Bingo, their hand comes off the weapon. They walk up, put a smile on, y'all chit chat for a few minutes. Before you know it, you're happy as can be. You're on your way with a $350 ticket. Everything's fine, all right? 350? No, you're, you're not going to get, it's not going to be that expensive. So anyway, keep your hands where you can see them. That's the key thing for these officers. They can't see your hands. They get real nervous, okay? So keep those hands where officers can see. 
and remain calm. Remember, you must control your emotions. It's just absolute. Do whatever the officers tell you. It may not make any sense. Just do it. We may handcuff you. We do that a lot till we sort things out. Don't take offense. We got keys. We'll let you go, okay? I'm telling you, you're going to see people die. It's going to be gruesome. It's not going to be pleasant. But folks, you got to deal with it. You got to be prepared with it. But if you are serious about this and you invest the time in the coming days to visualize at work, school, worship, at the grocery store, at all the different places you go on a regular basis, you visualize being there and applying the run, hide, fight tactics and techniques should a gunman come in, I'm telling you, the odds are this will be the outcome. You will go home alive. That is a really good outcome to a terribly bad situation. Let me conclude with this. This is not an act to shoot. It's a terrorist attack. About two and a half years ago, Paris, France, bought the Lawn Concert Hall. Terrorists go in and start shooting the place up. I got a brief from my friends at NYPD Counterterrorism. Read through it. I did a timeline. What I determined from the time they started shooting until the Paris police came in and engaged these guys was one hour, 35 minutes. Now, mind you, that's from them being mustered on the sidewalk outside the concert hall. By that time, 89 people were already dead. You ever find yourself in a deal like that? You don't have a survival mindset. It's not going to work out very good. Reading on through the brief, there were some people that had a survival mindset. Don't know where they got it, can't take credit. They did. They ran down the way, went in a room, shut the door, slid a refrigerator in front of the door, turned the lights off, sat on the floor in the dark. Terrorist comes by, meets resistance, makes him mad, fans it with a machine gun, bullet snakes through, catches a lady in the lake. She doesn't scream, she doesn't cry. They rally around, bandage her up. Everybody in that room went home alive. I can't stress how important survival mindset is for each and every one of us in this crazy world we live in today. Final question, why? Why does this guy get so excited about teaching this to us? And you may say, he doesn't want to see us die. Uh, not particularly. You got to realize, when you're dead, when I'm dead, we're out of the picture. We don't matter, frankly, anymore. What's left? The people that mean the most to you your family, your friends, your coworkers. In order to minimize the possibility of it happening, please, in the coming days, make the time to visualize and create your survival mindset. So God forbid it ever happened to you two and a half, six years from now, you will be able to make intelligent choices that will increase your odds of going home alive, all right? If you've got a concealed permit, see me afterwards. I'll give you some ideas. Now, we're going to have Q&A, but first of all, I want this guy lumbering around in the back to lumber on up here. This is Officer uh, Shea. Uh, he is one of our officers temporarily assigned to public affairs, which I know he dearly loves. <laughs> You know, in our business, you're assigned, you go where you're assigned, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, any questions you have, Officer Shea and I will try our best to answer for you, okay? The most important thing I'm going to recommend you guys, like he was saying about the hands, is most important. We don't know who are you. Muslim, Hindu, Christian, we don't know. We don't know you are the suspect, you are the victim. We don't want to see hands. Once we see hands, we are satisfied. We're going to keep moving forward. Traffic stops. Make sure hands are there. Talk to us. Don't be nervous. We're not, we're not going to hurt anybody. Majority of the time, I'll give you a tip. <coughs> you get pulled over on a traffic stop, right? What's the best thing you can do? Anybody? Have a smile on your face. That's all you want. We, have, we pulled you over because of a small, minor violation. <laughs> we have a duty to do, that's all we are doing. But when we approach you and you throw an attitude or look at me like you're crazy to pull me over, you're wasting my time, it doesn't sound good, right? There's a reason why I pulled you over. No matter what it is, there has to be a reason because we do not pull over people without a reason. We have to have a reason. That's why we pull over people. We talk to them. Majority of the time, people uh, we get pulled over. People pull, uh, get pulled over. 
and they are nice to us. They talk, I'm sorry officer, I didn't realize it, what happened? My guy had made a mistake. They agree to it. And majority of the time, 99% of the time, I, I just leave them alone. I just take them their warning. But when they tell me, why did you pull me over with an attitude? It doesn't work like that, <laughs> right? Because if I'm going to be nice to you, obviously you're going to be nice to me. You're not going to talk to me. But same goes to you. See what I'm saying? It's very easy, very simple. If you have any questions, ask me. Uh, if you all need any more training, uh, males, females, no matter who it is, you don't have no problem with it. Come talk to us. Let us know. These guys, they are civilians. But some of these guys, especially these guys, he has more knowledge than anybody else. So these guys are very knowledgeable. They are devoting their time towards these kind of incidents, and they are coming up with a better plan. We are trained to help people to survive, but they're going to give you more te techniques how to deal with these kind of situations. Okay? So any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I like the way that you explained, you know, very nice, but uh, it will be very helpful if we have a grid. Say, on a Friday when the masjid is full, that if we have a drill that is monitored by yourself or one of the police officers, that how actually people responded. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a two-phase program we're doing throughout Houston to about 10 of the mosques around Houston. I'm the first phase, then it's going to be followed up by some of our people in Criminal Investigation Division. They're going to actually come out here and they're going to check out your facility. They're going to write you a suggestion, a report. They're going to take pictures and they're going to make certain suggestions about things you can do to make your mosque safer. And, you know, they may make some suggestions about some drills. Okay. So that's, uh, that's part two and it's coming in the next week or so. Okay. So, so we have a lot of uh, mosques in uh, Houston. We have to cover it. So like he said, it's a phase one, just a phase one, just the beginning of it. Okay. We're trying to pay attention on all the requirements that people are asking us and we're keeping a note of it. Don't worry about it. We, we are going to be back with that. So this is plan A. Once we will get with the phase one, then we'll go to phase two, because like he said, we need to have a plan in order to do that. Once we have it set up, set up right, then we can go to the phase three. So that's how it's going to be. And one of the phase three, as I was telling the gentleman earlier, is I tell all my audiences, in 12, 18 months, call me back, because this stuff changes. Every time we have a terrible incident, we learn something. And so the program I do tonight is not going to be the same program in two months from now. So in a year, 18 months, call me back, have me back out, and let's go through this again, okay? But uh, let me just say this. We are really committed to the, uh, the Muslim community and helping you. I mean, we understand the terrific situation, terrible situation that happened in New Zealand. And because of that, we are doing everything we can to get your training as quick. If, if just the average person calls me, I'm booking in July and August right now. But it came down from the chief, Stephen, figure out how to do it. And so even though I have a full calendar, we're still getting this month before the end of this month, which is almost here, all 10 of the mosque train that were requested of us. So we really understand that this is a very sensitive thing and we want to give you the support. Your police department is behind you is all I got to really say, okay? So. Thank you. Now, take an extra brochure. My contact information's in there. Give it to a friend, a neighbor, whatever, because here, here's the deal. Right now, I need your help. I'm at about 65,000 people I've trained to date. Sounds like a big deal. But let me tell you, in my mind, I gotta get to 100,000 before I can retire. So help me get closer to retirement Give that brochure out, have them call me, let me get out there and train more people because the bottom line, seriously, the more people we educate, the more lives we're going to save, period. So 
thank you for your time, attention. Uh, more brochures? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, if not there, I got some on my pack. If not there, I got I one. I you had some question you were raising your hand. Did we have uh, another question? Him if you could share, is it okay to share that with the rest of us? To share the PowerPoint presentation? The, the problem is, as you saw, I put so much on it. If you want some more information, do this. My email is inside the brochure, inside, not on the back. Send me an email asking for more information. I, in fact, I have some information, uh, some sheets with different points. I'll be glad to send you, which would probably, honestly, serve you better than the PowerPoint. That works. Okay, do that. Yes, sir. Uh, what if you're not 100% sure where the after shooter is, and uh, you're not, uh, you don't have a good hiding place, and you're not, you're stuck with the decision whether to run or hide with whatever you have, what should you do? Well, you have to use your senses, situational awareness. Try your best to figure out where he is. But if you're not sure where he is, try to find the best hiding place you can, okay? Because running around not knowing where he is, you may run into him, and that's not good, okay? Uh, I was down to Santa Fe High School just the other day, and that was a problem. People caught in the hall, some of them <coughs> trying to leave. The shooter is standing there, and about two classrooms away is a hallway that crosses and goes to an outside door. And he was standing right there, and as people would run past, he would just shoot them. So those people running, in that case, not knowing where the shooter was, was not a real good idea. Okay, sir. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the was still there. Like oh yeah. Like like sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, take an extra brochure and take it to the principal at your school. <coughs> you go to school inside the city limits of Houston. Where do you go? Okay. Well. Their police department, I think, does his training, too, or similar to it, all right? So uh, that's the principal. Hey, why don't you get the police department? I, I went to a training up in Houston, and it's pretty decent. Why don't you call the Paraline Police Department and get them to come out and train at least the faculty and the staff? But frankly, I think high schoolers are very capable of dealing with this, just like you guys. Sure, okay. question two. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Hey, one second. Returning back to your question, always remember this. Think out of the box. Shooter can be, now I'm talking to you. <laughs> you ask me, you ask him a question. So I'm, I, I'm telling you this, think out of the box. Shooter can be from the school, outside it. You know, you don't know, right? Listen to, listen to your senses. Listen where the shooting is coming from. See. Wait, watch what people are doing. Don't just panic. Panic is not going to help. These are the guidelines we are giving you guys at situation where you, what you can do. But sometimes the situation is out of control. You do the best for your survival. What it needs to be done, you do it. Okay? Like example, you were asking again, if there is no way that you can block the door or anything like that, what about from the pipeline if you can slide down or something. You do what you want at that time to survive, isn't it? Because if somebody's trying to kill you, what you're gonna do? You will do what it needs to be done. And remember I said critical thinking? You make That's the what best decision you can. That's exactly what the officer's talking about is critical yeah. thinking. Okay. Yes, sir. In uh, New Zealand? Right. As well as here, those people praying Mm -hmm. When this guy, when he came in and shoot him. Mm -hmm. and what, what if we're here praying? Mm -hmm. and somebody comes and shooting, then what would what, what, we cause? That is a great question. And I've been thinking about this. And you guys got to think about this and help me out. You got to figure out how you can station at least one person out there to be your eyes and ears. I mean, I, I don't know 
what your belief is. I'll help but you on it, that. Yeah, I mean, if you could have one person watching, because if everybody's in here praying and your backs are to the shooter and he has free reign, oh, that's a formula for disaster. But, so, example. Yeah, go ahead. You're praying right now, okay? Somebody comes out the door, starts shooting. That's what your question is? Because you're praying. What you're going to do? We all Muslim, right? We all understand how prayers are important. But Allah said that. You do what needs to be survived. You have to survive. You have to survive. If you have to stop praying. You stop praying. If somebody who is not on a lookout, you hear it. You, you can sense the fear, right? That somebody's shooting. You stop praying and you do the best you can to survive. That helps. Uh, let me give you an idea. This just came to me. What if on your door out here, you had a little jingle bell? And whenever somebody comes in, it jingles. And you have two able-bodied people praying right by the back, by this door right here. And they're praying, and they hear that jingle. What do they do? They turn around, and they see who's coming in. If it's somebody walking in with a gun, their job, when he gets to that door, tackle him, get him on the ground. You know, that's a simple, inexpensive fix. So that's just one. But that's think, how, think about this. You, you'll that, come up with how, other that's ideas. That's how we do, right? If we are, me and my partner, we are, we are on patrol or we are in traffic stop, how are we going to let the other party know that I see something which was dangerous? I'm not going to tell him, run, run, run. I'm not going to tell him that. If he had a gun or a knife, I'm going to scream. I'm going to say, hey, gun, 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 gun. And my gun is going to be out. So my partner already knows there's a gun up there. You see what I'm saying? That's how we communicate. And we back up. So with y'all, what y'all can do is be mindful about it. And if there is a shooter or you guys see a gun, say something. Yo, this guy has a gun. This guy has a gun. Make sure that everybody can hear it. And people who hear it, stop doing what you do. Pay attention to what's going on. You have to run, you run. If you have to take down him, take him down. Whatever needs to be done to protect yourself, you can do it. You have some questions, man. Well, I have one question um, was like about calling the police, because I don't want to, like, it seems like in these kind of situations, the incident ends before the police have a chance to respond. So, you know, I guess most of us, when we first see these kind of things happening, our, maybe the first instinct is to call the police, even mm -hmm. though in the active situation, So, I guess what, what priority is it to call the police? Okay. If we start hearing something. He might, start, he, might, he might get a different answer to that. I will let him start off with it, and then I will tell you what I will do as a police officer. Uh, again, you have to critically think. You have to assess the situation. Is it, if he's right here, and you're in imminent danger of being shot or killed, Obviously, you're not going to take time to grab your phone and call 911. You're going to go for him, claw his eyes out, whatever you can to defend yourself, all right? Now, if you're in here and you hear something outside, sure, grab your phone, call 911, and tell us what's going on. Let us get on the way. It, you just have to assess it situation by situation. Because these are the, these are the guidelines, okay? But guidelines does not mean that you're going to 100% follow that step by step. Oh, no, Stephen said to do this first. Now, I'm not going to do that. Let me call 911 first. Now, you're not going to do that. You do what it's safe to do according to the situation. If the shooter is right in the room, you're not going to have a chance to call 911 first. Maybe you're going to hide or you're going to attack the person. Whatever you can do at that time. Make yourself safe first. Once you are safe, then call. A lot of people, when they do it, they call their family or they just put on Snapchat. Hey, you got to shoot it. <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you. A lot of yeah. things, I mean, the New Zealand shit. Yeah. It's everywhere, everywhere it was viral before even yeah. police were still there on the scene. It was already viral. 
because somebody was that recording. I'm okay with it, but come on. Okay. Life is more important. I mean, the, if you're here like right, right now, ladies, you have a door. I would get up, I'd run out the door, and when I get out here to a reasonably safe position, hiding behind something, I'd get my phone and I'd call from that safe position. Don't do it while you're here in, in harm's way. So, yes, sir. Something always scared me, like if somebody uh, entered your home because they thought you, there's no one uh, there and you hide in the bathroom, how am I going <coughs> to make my voice? Talking to the 911, there's no message, no text message. I don't want to. I think you can actually text message 911 these days. Yes, you can. A uh, couple of things. Uh, like that kind of question is regarding the home region, right? It's pretty much kind of a similar situation like that. But I would highly recommend you guys to get with the most people, let them know what are you guys have your questions and concerns regarding the drug area. There is a difference between a drug area and a robbery than a home invasion, okay? All these incidents, uh, car accidents, anything. I'm pretty sure you guys have a lot of questions. You guys don't know what to do, and you guys do panic at the time. I'm glad that you asked that, but I would have, before I answer that question, I want you to get with your, uh, whoever is in charge of the boss, and he already handed you the email uh, you know, address, phone numbers, and all and that. And wh which one is number? The one it's the inside, Stephen Daniels. Stephen Daniels. Okay. So let us know what are the questions. And uh, talk to other females also, other males also. Let us know. We'll come up with a plan. We'll have a small class for you guys sure. regarding the burglary, accidents, anything, gun license, whatever you guys need knowledge about to get educated. We'll come out here and do that. And we have people in public affairs specialized yes. in all those areas. So you call us up, we can get out there with the right person and do the training. Mm -hmm. With your, uh, with what you were asking you at home what you can do. Somebody, like I said, same situation. Somebody already inside you. It depends on how big you how big your office or a house. If you can hide, first hide. You know, if you can take it down, you don't have a choice, you do it. First you make yourself safe. Then call my phone. I mean there's no way to fix it. You you can. Okay. You can. Even if you dial 911 and you hang up or you just dial 911 and you can say anything. Oh, okay. 911 dispatchers listen to what's going on. Okay. If you don't even say anything, just tell them your address. You hide in the closet, right? Like he said, don't say anything, don't make noises and all that stuff, right? Only that somebody's trying to kill me. This is my address. Because the problem is, I know this is this is what happened with me when I was in an accident and stuff. You call 911, they ask you nonsense. Oh, so many questions. Questions. Yeah. And it's like, let me tell you what happened. And they ask you, okay, what's your name? Why are you calling me? Yeah. Listen to me first. So be assertive with them. Sometimes these, these people are not, I'm not going to say they're not the train, but they do according to the protocol so that they can direct you to the proper channel. But if you do have that emergency, tell them, my life is in danger, send police to this address. Say that one time. And if you have to hang up or if you have to leave the phone on, you do it. Because what happens is, whatever you say is recorded. If they didn't even hear you correctly, what they're going to do is they're going to report, they're going to remind it, and they're going to hear it. Where is, where is that coming from? And I would recommend you to put your phone on silent rather than turn it off. You know why? Because we can uh, we can track down from the cell towers that where is the signal coming from and exactly pinpoint your house if you didn't catch the address. You see what I'm saying? And you might put it on mute. Also. Yes. So if the dispatcher is going, hello, 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 they don't hear through your phone the dispatcher saying that it is on mute. But you know, they the dispatcher can still hear what's going on through your phone. And there's a lot more knowledge and uh, information we can provide you guys. I want you guys to come up with the plan. Let these people know, 
saying, oh, you guys let us know. But have some couple of people so that we can have a small class like that and we, we get educated. Yes, sir. It's not a question, it's a concern. Okay. Your presentation was good, but this is less than a percent of people that come to this match team. So how do we get this information to the rest to 100 percent of the people who come to this next year? We need you. Yeah, we, we need you to publicize it. And I don't know how I recorded long. it. Uh, Pardon? I recorded the whole thing. Okay, well that's good. It's recorded. You can now play it okay. for these people. That's a good thing. But again, keep in mind, you're not limited just to one training. Yes, I have seriously 100, 101 actually. Training is all my caliber right this minute. But call us up. We'll find a way to get out here. And if you you get you know, another 30 or 40 people here, we'll find a way to get out here and do a training. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to share. I think Speak up. <laughs> I wanted to share this because, like, like, you don't even have to call 911 anymore on the iPhone. You just have to, like, press this five times. And Yep. Yeah. There you There's go. There's a lot of things like that you can use on your iPhone. Like, you can press it on the side button. There's five times the side button. One, two, three, four, five. There's automatic even down on the one button. And, and you need to know, on any technology issue, all you got to do is find a teenager. You just ask a teenager. That's it. That's all you got to do. They got the answers, okay? So, other questions? Yes? Yes. Self-defense classes? Not that I'm aware of in the department. Let me tell you what I do know. Rice University has a course called RAD, and you call their Rice University Police Department, and they can connect you with the people. And that course is predominantly for women, okay? But it's very physical. They get this guy, they put him in this big rubber suit, you go up and you kick him. You're going to be tired when you're through it. It's good training, it really is, okay? But it's good to run. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. In building like this, how many exits we should have? Like I said, for that, there's going to be another class. Because we're going to build another one. Mm -hmm. So that's why my question. Oh, well then, if you're going to build another building. I think we should at least have one. Before you start the building and the concept part, call us and ask us to come out and sit down with you and the architect. Because we can make suggestions that before they even draw the plans, they can incorporate those. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to places like uh, downtown Houston, the, the ballet, a beautiful multi-million dollar building. They never consulted us. And then after the fact, they called us in and I made certain suggestions. Now they made some changes. They spent some extra money that if they called us in at the beginning, they could have just built it that way originally. It wouldn't cost any more money. So please get us involved in the concept stage and we'll be glad to share uh, ideas so will be. Have the plan. They already did the plan. Uh, for well, they plan. haven't started building. Yes. So the plan can still be so changed. That's not, that's my, yeah. My yeah, give like us a call. You can, they can ask you to give us a suggestion about the exit. Well, we can look at your plans and we can have a conversation and talk about things that we'd suggest. And then you can make a decision. So Is that cost effective or not? Sure. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you get this one. and you're not sure who in the police department to talk to, call me, I will get you to the right people. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.